Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and I'm spending this weekend in the Austrian Alps at my friend's place and I thought I'm going to use this opportunity to talk to you about the last one and a half years of this channel, some of the talks we heard and what we have learned and um, especially this question of why is it that Europe seems to be at war, at least mentally. It's something that I call the logic of war and this and war mentality. It's Articles like these that just keep making me want to throw up day and every day again um, from the New York Times from today, uh, September 2nd, a brutal path forward uh, for Ukraine, village by village. Well, there's another path forward and that's through negotiations. But why is it that neither the North Americans nor the Europeans seem to be willing to contemplate this? The Kremlin has said time and again that they are open for negotiations uh, as long as they're realistic. Uh, and the Europeans are saying like, no, and the Ukrainians are saying like, we, we won't have any of that. It's going to be all or nothing. Um, get, uh, get back the Donbass, get, get back uh, Crimea, to which they are entitled to. Don't get me wrong. They are entitled to that. But it's not realistic to stop the dying and stop the killing. So um, we've got other articles like Ukraine's offensive has made notable progress, White House says, and we have read this over and over again. It's these articles that make us think that victory is around the corner and Ukraine, the underdog, will beat um, the evil overlords. But we've also uh, learned and seen over the last one and a half years that sh that's just not what what's happening and yes Western propaganda tries to actually sell us the idea that the uh, Russians are about to lose uh, this war and that this large army has made, uh, made only incremental gains but the, ma the the sheer fact is that Russia is not willing to lay waste to Kiev and Lviv and use all its potential that it has in order to wage an actual war so the question is, why can we not get back to uh, peace negotiations and where can we not end this war the way that almost every single European war ends, which is in a conference? 1815, the Congress of Vienna uh, is what ended the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, the Crimean War was ended in, uh, in negotiations. You've had eight, uh, 1918, Versailles. You had 45, San Francisco. You had the uh, uh, Conference for S Security and Cooperation in Europe during the Cold War, which was the beginning of the end of the Cold War uh, back in 1975. So the question is, when do we sit down and hammer out a, a peace agreement uh, for a new European uh, security architecture and structure um, and why is it that we can't get there and one of the sad issues here is that the way that this war has galvanized public opinion in Europe um, has made it almost impossible to get to a moment when Europeans are willing again to talk to the to the Russians um, you RT is banned, Sputnik is banned, um, all of these cultural events um, all around Russia and so on were banned and that is part of the logic of war. If you want a real enemy you need to demonize that enemy and that demonization has taken place partially because of the, um, the goals of the neocons, as we have heard in some of the, the talks that I had on this channel, and partially because you have this willing journalistic um, propaganda machine that lends itself to just helping, fostering such, a, such an, an environment. And that has to do with the idea that these journalists have of doing good, doing the right thing, right? Just as uh, well, one of the speakers on this, on this channel said, it would be wrong to not support Ukraine and Ukraine is the new uh, good thing to do and the amazing thing or the the very sad part is that a large number of Europeans have swallowed this pill many many more than during the Vietnam War uh, that right now as Jens Stoltenberg said weapons are actually the way to peace and that everybody wants peace the Russians want their peace, the Europeans want their peace, and the Ukrainians want it in their way. And at the moment, uh, the logic that we have is that both sides, the Russians, the Europeans, I mean NATO and the Ukrainians, are only willing 
to accept an outcome that would align with their with their goals and the way that we got there is through constant escalation and as we have heard from Friedrich Glasel just a few weeks ago this uh, this escalation trajectory of the different conflicts that have been going on has been getting worse and worse. And what, what are those conflicts? It's at, at least three. A conflict between uh, Russia and the United States, a great power conflict, a war in Ukraine between the Russians and the, uh, the West Ukrainians, and a war even deeper inside Ukraine between the Eastern Ukrainians in the Donbas and the Western Ukrainians. Uh, on, on the other hand, and these, these linguistic groups, it's not all about it's not all about the the, 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 um, uh, the linguistic parts, of course. But the matter of the fact is that you have several conflicts inside Ukraine that could be used in order to for outside forces to tap into them, and we've seen how it got worse. And everybody who's older than like 35 years or so um, will remember that. Ukraine spiraled out of control ever after 2014, ever after the Maidan. Now, one group in Europe says, well, this was a revolution of dignity, right? Of, uh, of Ukraine basically finding itself and expelling a corrupt leader. But the, sh the matter of the fact is that corrupt leader was diplomat uh, democratically elected. <laughs> he was a democratically elected leader, and he was not more or less corrupt than others that, that were ruling over, over Ukraine before and after. And after 2014, when Ukraine still had a neutrality uh, clause in its constitution, just remember that, the, it, it, the Ukrainian constitution said Ukraine will be neutral, um, that was replaced by a clause that said Ukraine will, will seek for NATO membership in also response to 2008 when it was promised NATO membership, when Ukraine wasn't even asking for it yet. So you see how, these, how this dynamic uh, just made things get, get worse because then the Russians invade Crimea and, uh, and, and clip it off Ukraine. Ukraine uses that as a, as a reason to, um, the, the leadership in Kiev uses it as, as a reason to get rid of the neutrality clause. And then you, you have this Minsk agreement, which later on even Angela Merkel and Hollande said it was only done in order, it was only a deal cut in order to allow uh, more time to arm Ukraine <coughs> for seven years. And now we're at the point where you have a NATO army with you, staffed with Ukrainians fighting against Russians in Ukraine. And does this absolve Russia from the sin of invasion? No, it doesn't. And I have, I got a lot of negative reactions about that, but it is really important to remember one thing. In 1945, it was again outlawed to uh, to do an to uh, and do an aggressive war. The only exception, the only exception, is Article 51 in the UN Charter, which says you are allowed to defend your own country and 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 the end is the problem. You are allowed to help another country to defend its own territory. And this goddamn clause that allows for collective self-defense has been used in almost every single war since 1945 to justify invasions. It was exactly that, uh, that kind of argument that was used by the Americans to invade Iraq. It was that argument that was used to bomb Libya to help. It was that argument that's being used even in Syria whenever there's like interventionism from the West. It's like, oh, we're just helping these like poor group people X or state X to defend itself. And Russia is doing exactly the same uh, because it recognized the Donbas republics uh, five days before the invasion in order to argue that under international law. It's just helping the Ukrainians to defend itself. And this um, idea that you go and defend yourself with others abroad. Self-defense abroad is the kernel of all aggressive evil since the Second World War. And even though I understand why Russia invaded, and I'm not a friend of that, I understand the logic behind it because the Russians do feel vulnerable and every single um, security experts, even in the US, from uh, George Kennan, Jack Matlock and so on, they've all said uh, Ukraine has a very special place to the to the Russians. If you try to make it a NATO member, there will be a war. Now you try to make it a member, there is a war. 
it, this was foreseeable. It wasn't good. It wasn't right, but it was foreseeable. And what should have happened was de-escalation. Now we know from Jeffrey Sachs and others that de-escalation is something that the neocons actively don't want. And for over a year I had this question, why is it that Ukraine didn't become neutral? Or why is it that neutrality didn't emerge naturally as a way to pacify the entire region? Because it would be in the interests of everybody. It would have been in the interest of Ukraine, of the Western Europeans and of the Russians. And we know that the Russians wanted it. But we also now know that this tiny group of neocons proactively worked against such an outcome. So we know that there were people who said it's better to risk or even have a war than to settle for anything less but total control and total dominance. And within this logic of war, if you have neocons who, who, who go for that strategy, you know that on the other hand, the Russians at some point will actually have, a, will be forced to go along because otherwise you don't have a state left otherwise they will just try to bring the the fight to you and that's what the russians understood from the reactions of the west especially in 2021 when the west just said like no we are not going to uh, negotiate with you any kind of uh, security uh, settlement in europe uh, russia you have to know your place sit down and shut up they didn't it was war the the, the russians vladimir putin chose to actually uh, assert the russian uh, Russia's point here in the geopolitical field um, and that then creates this logic right that then creates this problem that um, you force each other to fight and the Russians force the Ukrainians to fight it's not difficult to know why the Ukrainians fight yes you do have probably a corrupt uh, reg uh, regime in Kiev but you also have people who are under attack and everybody will fight for their own land um, the Austrians would, fi would fight for their land and the Swiss, Swiss would fight for theirs and if you if you put a knife at the throat of someone they will try to defend themselves and the Russians felt like they had a knife at their throat and the Ukrainians are feeling like they have a, having a knife at their throat and this is being fueled from the outside um, so what we need to do is to get back to a de-escalation de just at the moment it still doesn't look like it um, and the, the, the Europeans are still caught in this idea that Putin is Hitler and Hitler had to be defeated now this is what I call the long shadow of Adolf Hitler because with Adolf Hitler you again justify fighting in the East kill as many Russians as possible have in the process as many Ukrainians slaughtered as necessary but Europe is willing to do that at the moment and willing to to see Ukraine uh, shattered and they would rather have every single Ukrainian dead than give Ukraine up to the Russians and that kind of mentality is a very very European mentality it's this we dictate what's going to happen and we are going to to uh, cushion it in the rosy language of being good citizens of doing the right thing of standing up for um, for justice when in fact all it is is bleeding out the poorest people of Europe and believe me it is no coincidence that Ukraine before the war and also now is the poorest country in Europe because the bourgeoisie and those goddamn warmongers that have so much money and that make so much money they always let others bleed and currently the Western warmongers and business leaders they let the Ukrainian proletariat bleed for them and uh, the Russians they they hired their poorest people with like big uh, promise of big salaries to go and bleed for them in Ukraine and this will just perpetuate itself unless this chain is broken now the chain cannot be broken unfortunately by the Ukrainians probably not even by the Russians but it could be broken by the Europeans if the Europeans finally said enough is enough uh, we will sit down and negotiate with the people that we don't agree with because that's what you do you don't do peace negotiations with your enemies you negotiate peace with uh, with well you don't negotiate peace with your friends you negotiate peace with your enemies um, it is an incredible tragedy and the hope I have is that maybe from the outside from people that are not caught in this bubble of this good against evil from the Indians from the uh, Southeast Asians uh, that we get help from them because Europe at the moment needs help because it is caught again in its very own very European BS uh, thinking that uh, 
you need to use war in order to get to the good solution and using again Hitler as an argument to do so so um, my friends the logic of war and this this um, this spiraling into catastrophe um, needs to be broken and I hope that an outside force will do so and that we can then enjoy the beautiful nature and friendship of the Ukrainians, of the Russians and of the Americans uh, somewhere in the Alps. Thank you.